Well, Father, we love you. And uh, Lord, this is an issue that several of us face. Some face it more than others. But Lord, nonetheless, it's still a problem. And Lord, my prayer would be that we'd be set free from that today, Lord. If we struggle with the, the worry about different things in life, God, that uh, Lord, we'd understand your word. And Lord, that your word would help us and give us everything that we need, God, to just help us to move past this. God, open up, your, uh, open up our hearts right now, Lord, as we just give everything to you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, I heard about this, uh, this young guy that, man, he just graduated from business school, and he ended up getting a degree in accounting. So, you know, just like everybody else that's right out of college, they decide to go, you know, get into the one ads and look for the people that are hiring, and, and he ends up coming across this small business owner, had a job ad in there looking for a, an accountant. So he went and he applied for that, and he got a phone call back, and he went in for the interview. And as he came in, he ended up meeting the business owner, and he was a real a little nervous guy. He was just nervous about a lot of things. Things. And as they sat there and talked, the owner said, you know what? He said, I'm looking for an accountant to hire. But he said, more than just looking for an accountant, he said, I'm looking for somebody to do my worrying for me. And the guy looked at him for a second and was like, okay, excuse me, I don't really understand. And the business owner said, well, you know what? I worry about everything. He said, I worry about, you name it, he said, I worry about it. And he said, you know what? I've just decided as a business owner, he said, I don't want to worry about money anymore. So he said, so what I've decided to do is he said, I'm going to hire somebody to do all my worrying for me. And he said, uh, when it comes to money. So he said, I want you to worry about all my money problems. He said, that way I do not have to worry about that. So the young man sat there and thought for a second. He said, okay. He said, well, how much are you going to pay me? And he said, well, tell you what. He said, I'll start you off. And he said, I'm going to pay you $80,000 a year. And the young boy looked at him and thought, wow. He said, that's a lot of money, $80,000 a year for a young business like that. He said, how in the world are you going to be able to afford that? And the guy looked at him and said, I have no idea. That's your first worry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you wish it was that simple sometimes? Don't you wish you could just hire somebody to do all your worrying for you? You know what? I'll just give you some money. You just do all my worrying for me so I can just clock out when it comes to worry. You know, someone had accumulated a list of church bloopers over the years. You know, and, and, and the church bulletins that if you read them the wrong way, then they can mean something totally different as you read them. But on that list of church bloopers, one of them said this. It said, don't let worry kill you. Let the church help. <laughs> See, if you read that the wrong way, that could, be, uh, that could kind of be bad, right? Uh, unfortunately, you know what? Worry has a strange way of killing people. It has a strange way of getting into people's life. And the poet Robert Frost from the late 1800s, uh, mid-1900s, he said the reason, uh, the reason why worry kills more people than work is because more people worry than work. Isn't that the truth? You know, sometimes I'm convinced that I think that we work at worrying. I think that we want to worry. I think that we have things in our life that we can't stop uh, worrying about. Guys, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, worry has become a huge problem. Worry is a huge problem uh, for several of us. Worry is, is a problem for so many people. And guys, I'm telling you what, worrying is very, very destructive. And it can be very destroying to your life and to the people around you if you do not get the problem of worry under control. Guys, I believe the fact is that probably some of you in here today have no idea how to live without worrying. I believe you have no idea how to face the day without worrying about something. Because worrying has become so ingrained into your personalities. It's been so ingrained. It's become so much of who you are. And I'm convinced that if you had nothing to worry about, you would worry about not having anything to worry about. Can some of you relate to that? You don't have to rat yourself out if you don't want to. But my guess is, is probably some of you have a real struggle when it comes to this area in your life. Guys, listen. We become professionals when it comes to worrying. It's become the best thing. It's, been, it's become how we view life and how we view so many things. Now, I wear uh, corrective lenses, and I've said this before. You know, I can't see without my glasses or my contacts. I have to have something. And I've said this before. I'm really cheap when it comes to contacts. And I wear the contacts that every three months I'm supposed to dispose them and put a new, uh, new contact in, you know, and wear them. But here's the problem I have is contacts are expensive. They're expensive. And at three months... My 
my contact's still working real good, so I really struggle with throwing it in the trash can and, and you know, and, and getting rid of it. So here's what I think. If I think I can get an extra month or 12 months out of my three-month pair, then I'll go ahead and I'll stretch it as long as I can until I just can't bear it anymore, and then I'll finally throw it away. But here's the deal. When I finally throw my contacts away and I put a fresh pair in, it's like, wow! I can see. I didn't even realize how clear I can see. And I don't even realize how good my contact lens feels in there. You know, when you put a fresh pair in and you don't realize how cloudy it is until you replace it with something else. Listen to this, guys. Some of us have become so dependent on viewing everything through a clouded contact lens of worry that we have no idea how to live without worrying. It's become the way we've viewed absolutely everything that we view in life. And it's clouded our view of everything. We worry about our future. We worry about our finances. We worry about our health. We worry about our children. We worry about our grandchildren. We worry about our relationships. We worry about school. We worry about jobs. We worry about the deadlines we have to meet. We worry about our overloaded, overlapping schedules. We worry about the upcoming election. We, we worry about who's going to be running this country. We worry about things going on in the Middle East. We worry about terrorist attacks. We worry about how everything's going to affect their economy. You know that USA Today had an article a few years back stating that money and economy top the list of stressors that people worry about. You know, I believe that. Have you ever worried about money before? Have you ever worried about finances before? I tell you what, that's probably the most common thing that people worry about is they worry about finances. And if you've never worried about that, praise God. But a lot of people do. And I can tell you, it can ruin your life and destroy you. And it's not a fun place to be. Listen, guys, like I said earlier, worry is a real problem. And in the midst of a world full of worry worts, you know what Jesus says? Jesus says there's a better way. There's a better way. We don't have to be worry warts. We don't have to worry about everything. We don't have to constantly have our brain going nonstop, worrying about every single thing you do. Jesus says there's a better way. And on the Sermon on the Mount is our next uh, passage that we're going to uh, be looking at today. Jesus actually addresses this. In our scripture, we're going to be in Matthew 6, 25 through 34. So uh, go ahead and open it up in your Bibles. We're also going to have it in the, in the bulletin. It'll also be up on the screen. But go ahead and open it up in, in the Word of God so you can highlight this and make notes as we go along. Listen, guys. As you read the Bible, some scriptures, you know what, they can be kind of confusing, some scriptures. Some scriptures can even be hard to understand, and some might even be difficult to interpret. But can I tell you that this scripture that we're getting ready to, uh, to read today, it ain't one of them. It's not one of them. Jesus is crystal clear on this. This is not hard to understand. This is not uh, open for debate. This is not hard to interpret. And in fact, Jesus uses the word in just this short, brief scripture. He uses the word worry six times, and he ends up telling us not to worry three times. He constantly keeps going. Listen, guys, Jesus is against a constant, ongoing, high anxiety and unhealthy lifestyle of worrying. So you know what? If you're a worry wart today, if you're somebody that constantly worries, then my prayer for you has been throughout the week is that you'd find freedom today. That you would find freedom and that you could get out from underneath that heavy yoke that worry puts on you and that heavy load that it puts on you. So follow along with me as I read the day, today's scripture. And we're going to start off in verse 25. And these are in the words of Jesus. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you. Therefore, I tell you. Now, I'm going to stop just a second. Gosh, this is going to be a long message if we're only going to get that far before I have to stop. But the word therefore, I want you to understand, anywhere in the Bible, if you see the word therefore, that means there, that's you being used as a bridge. God's using that bridge to connect the verse before. If he says therefore, that means what's he saying therefore about? So you have to go back and read the prior uh, verses to understand the whole thing of the story. So if he says this and he says therefore, then he says this, you've got to go back and look. Now, does anybody remember what we talked about last week or did we forget about that already? But Jesus in last week and he says man cannot serve both God and money. Isn't that what he said at the end of last week? He said we cannot serve both God and money. We can't have two masters. We got to pick one or the other. Now if you remember right on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking to his disciples. So he's talking to believers. He's talking to disciples out there. So Jesus is assuming since we're his disciples, since he uh, he's talking to the crowd of his disciples, that they're going to choose God. That they're going to choose God. You can't have two masters. You can either have God or you can serve money. Therefore Therefore, if you're serving God, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, or what you will 
wear or, or about what your life or what you will eat or drink or about your body. I said that twice. I apologize. What you will wear. Is it not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can, can any of you, by worrying, add one single hour to your life? Starting uh, in, in verse 28. And why do you worry about your clothes? So see how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the fields, which is here today and gone tomorrow, is thrown into the fire... Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Verse 33, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So okay, we're going to break this passage down into two major points concerning worry. We're going to break it up into two major points, but we're going to actually look at several reasons throughout this scripture that Jesus tells us why we should not worry. So point number one in your outline, we should not worry because first of all, worry is a worthless exercise. Worry is a worthless exercise. Everyone say worthless. worthless. It's a worthless exercise. You know what? Exercise is hard to get used to, right? Exercise is not something maybe any of us just get excited about doing exercise and just jump right out of bed. Now, some do. I understand that. But most people would not exercise if it was useless, right? If there was no point to exercising, if there was no value in it, if there was no reason to exercise, we exercise because there's value to it. There's a point to it. Guys, my guess is that if there's no uh, point to it, no value, we wouldn't do it. Well, guess what? Worry is a worthless exercise. It's an exercise that there's absolutely no value to it whatsoever, yet we consume most of our day worrying. We consume most of our day worrying. And you know what? Just like on this video where the guy said, hey, I'll give my girlfriend $5,000 if she could think of one good thing that comes out of worrying. You know, she couldn't name one good thing, and I would say probably neither could we. Nothing good comes out of worrying. It's a useless exercise. Listen, guys, we're going to learn in our scripture today that Jesus loves us. And because he loves us, he promises us that he's going to provide for us and he's going to take care of our need. So let's look at verse 25. Verse 25 says, do not worry. Guys, the literal translation for do not worry is stop worrying. Jesus is saying, stop it. Just stop worrying. Stop worrying about where you're gonna, where the food's going to come from, where your drink's going to come from, where your clothes are going to come from. He says that I am going to take care of all your basic needs. I'm going to provide the things that you need. Now listen, guys, he's going to provide your needs, not your wants. How many of you know that there's a difference between needs and wants? See, I want all kinds of things, but he says I'm going to provide all your needs. We need to be concerned of that and we need to trust that he's going to take care of all of our needs. Now I want us to pull over for just a second because I want us to understand what this doesn't mean. I want us to understand what this doesn't mean. First of all, this does not mean that we're not supposed to plan for the future. That's not what Jesus is talking about. When he says stop worrying, when he says do not worry, he's not talking about we're not supposed to plan for the future. See, the, the King James Version, if you have that version, the phrase instead of do not be worried, it says take no thought. That's what the King James Version says. It says take no thought. And this has become misleading for some over the years. Over the years, people have interpreted this to mean that you know what? You're not to take no thought concerning, uh, concerning future planning. Just don't think about it, don't take no thought in it. That means there's no reason to plan retirement. There's no uh, reason to have any kind of career ambitions. There's no reason to, to seek out buying life insurance. Just take no thought. Just sit back coast and trust God for everything. I don't believe that that's what Jesus is talking about. I do not believe that that's the wordage that's going on here. That's not what he's understanding. Jesus is not against planning. In fact, I believe that Jesus is for planning. I believe that Jesus wants us to work hard. I believe that Jesus wants us to plan for the future. And I can tell you that I think there's more scriptures that would say it's foolish if we don't than him saying not to, to just take no thought, don't worry about it. He wants us to plan for our future. So Jesus is saying don't, he's not saying don't plan for the future. And then second thing he's not saying, he's not saying don't be concerned about anything. 
He's not saying that we shouldn't, we just, ah, oh, just don't worry about it. Don't be concerned about anything. Just kind of, you know, just kind of drift along. Don't worry about that. Guys, there's a major difference between worrying and being concerned for things. Big difference, big difference. In fact, I would say if you're not concerned about anything, then we're probably not doing everything right. For instance, parents, you know what? We should be concerned about the safety of our children, right? We could be, should be concerned about a lot of things. You know, for instance, um, my oldest daughter, she's 19, and she goes to school at Maryville. And then she dates some boy from Trenton, so sometimes, you know, the highways are burning up. Uh, a little bit. So, you know what? She's on the road a lot. And every Sunday afternoon, uh, every Sunday afternoon when Chase, her boyfriend's getting ready to head back to Kirksville and, and Josie's getting ready to take back off to Maryville, you know what we do as a family? We gather up together and I say a little word of prayer and I pray for Chase and Josie as they uh, go out throughout this week and that God would get them there safely and take them there. And then you know what I do? I tell Josie, I said, when you get there, I want you to shoot me a text to let me know that you're there. Guys, here's the deal. I'm concerned as a parent for her safety. I want to make sure she she gets there. But let me tell you what I don't do. I don't sit there and stew the floor and walk around and pace for two hours chewing my fingernails off, worried whether she's going to get there or not. I'm concerned for her safety. You know what? I pray about it and we leave it in God's hands and we go from there. As a parent, we should be concerned in a lot of things, but we don't have to worry about anything. We can trust God for it. You know what? We should also be concerned when it comes to our health. You know, having a healthy concern or a concern for your health, it'll cause you to eat. It'll, right, it'll cause you to exercise. It'll cause you to go to the doctor for some checkups. And you know what? If something's not working right, we don't need to waste every waking hour of our life worrying about it. You know what? We try to do what we can to fix the things. We pray, we give it to God and trust Him for the results. See, there's a difference between worry and being concerned. You know, we can also be concerned about our finances. You know, if you're in here today and you're drowning financially, you know what a healthy concern might look like? A healthy concern might look like that you go to somebody that's a lot smarter than you when it comes to money. And they can maybe help you put a budget together and help you put some finances together. A healthy concern for money and finances might cause you to go get a different job. Might cause you to get a part-time job. But you know what? You don't have to lay in bed every waking hour worrying about it. There's a difference between worry and being concerned. Listen, guys, the point is this. There's a lot of things in our life that we should be concerned about. However, the Bible's very clear that we're not to worry. The root idea of the verb here, worry, means to be pulled apart. That's what worry means. It means to be pulled apart. And in fact, the, the proper understanding of the King James Version here, take no thought, actually means to be drawn in different directions. That's what worry means. Have you ever felt like that before? Have you ever felt like you've been drawn in different directions? How you're being pulled apart by worry? Have you ever felt like that before? Guys, there's a difference between worry and being concerned. Concern is when you can do something about to help the situation and you do what you can and you trust God for the results. Worry is when you can't do anything about the situation but you refuse to trust God with the results so instead you sit around and worry about it. So in other words, worry is concern out of control. Okay? It doesn't just stop with being concerned and doing something about it. Now I can't shut my mind off about it and it goes non-stop. Guys, here, the next thing I'm getting ready to say... Some of you are probably, uh, you might not agree with me, and you might even tune, tune me out, but I believe, and until you, uh, until you understand and come to the realization what I'm getting ready to say, it's going to be really hard to stop worrying in your life if you're a worrier. Are you ready for this? Worry is sin. Worry is sin. In fact, I want us to say that together. Say, worry is sin. Again, worry is sin. One more time. Worry is sin. And until you're convinced of that, until you acknowledge that worry is sin, then I'm telling you what, it's going to be really, really hard to get past this. Listen, guys, we can spiritualize it all we want. We can try to spiritualize our worry all we want to make us feel good about ourselves. But guys, the truth remains, when we worry, we're not trusting God. When we worry, we are absolutely not trusting God. A worrying Christian is a sinning Christian. And the reason it's so important to admit it is because you can't change what you first don't acknowledge. Can every single one of you agree with me, as a Christian, we should want to get sin out of our life? Right? As a Christian, we should want to get sin out of our life. We should want to be able to lay that down. Guys, the sin of worrying 
It is absolutely no different than any other sin. It's no different than somebody struggling with lust, somebody struggling with sexual sins, somebody struggling with anger, unforgiveness, gluttony, gossip, bitterness, or any other sin that, you can, that has your number. As a Christian, we should want to lay it down. And worry is a sin. So until you understand that worry is a sin, until you come to the grips of that, you're never going to get rid of it because you're going to say, oh, that's just how I'm wired. That's just how I'm wired. I'm just a worrier, and I'm just going to worry about everything. No, you got to come to the grips that worry is sin, and you got to admit it. you got to stop making excuses. And just like any other sin, any other sin, how we get rid of it is we repent, right? We tell God we're sorry. God, please take this from us, and we lay it down. I tell you what, when you understand that worry is sin, and the next time you start worrying, and you say, God, forgive me, forgive me, I lay it down at your feet, until we get to that point, man, we're just going to continue in that cycle. So again, Jesus says worry is a worthless exercise. So Jesus gives us a few reasons why we shouldn't worry. First of all, he gives us the big picture. And he says he's going to, and he does that by telling us he's going to take care of us. In verse 25, he says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Listen, guys, most of us don't have to worry every day whether our brain's going to keep working, right? How many of you thought about today whether and whether your brain was going to keep working today? Most of us don't think about that, right? Most of us don't. We don't worry about wondering whether our brain's going to keep working. We don't worry about whether our heart's going to keep pumping. We don't worry about the complexity of all the human organs working together to keep us alive. Most of us don't go to bed at night worrying whether we're going to wake up the next morning. We just assume that everything is going to keep working while we're sleeping until we wake up the next day. Jesus says, listen. He says, is not life more than food? Is not body more than clothes? He's trying to take us from something greater to something lesser. In other words, he's saying this. He's saying, and if we can trust him as the creator of life, if we can trust him as the creator of life, then why can't we trust him as the sustainer of life? God spoke us into existence. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God's the creator of all things? Then don't you think as a Christian, as a believer, that we can believe that he can provide for us? He's saying, is life not more important? Is the body not more important? You don't stress and worry about all that, so stop worrying. It's a worthless exercise. Instead, be hopeful. And then Jesus goes on, and he gets a little bit more specific here about how he's going to provide for us. And in this next passage, or in this passage, he ends up giving us some examples concerning nature. Don't you love nature? I believe that we can learn so much from nature as we watch nature. And he ends up giving us some examples of nature, because here's the deal, guys. Everything in nature works together because all of nature trusts God. They're just doing what they're created to do, right? They're just working together, making things happen. They don't think about it. They don't worry about it. They just do what they were created to do. However, you know what man does? Man worries. He's pulled apart. He's drawn in different directions because he tries to live his own life dependent on his own material wealth. And God says, Jesus says, hey, you know what? Let's learn from nature. He tells us not to worry because he's going to take care of our material needs. If we see in verse 26, he says this. He says, just look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Are you not much more valuable than they? Listen, guys, the Bible says that man was created in the image of God. He doesn't say that about the birds. He doesn't say that about the beast of the, that roamed the earth. He doesn't say that about the fish of the sea. He doesn't say that about any other creature except for man. He said man, human beings, was created in his image. He created them to, to be in his image. And he's saying this. He says, you know what, if I take care of the birds... If I take care of the birds, just think how much more I love you. I love you. You're so much more valuable than the birds. And I take care of them. And then he tells us, he says, look, just look at the birds. The, the, the words look here that's being used, it's a very strong verb. And it's, and it's saying, take a good look at it. It's not just taking a glance. It's taking a good look at it. You know, I come home from lunch the other day. Or uh, come home to lunch the other day, and as I walked in the house, Ginger, our cat, uh, was sitting up on the windowsill, just like it perches itself up there uh, for the last four years of the cat's life, and the cat was just sitting there looking at the birds. Would not take her eyes off of them birds. We're just sitting there watching them, watching them. They would move, she'd move, just looking uh, so much at that. Now, I don't believe that Ginger was looking at the birds to learn from the birds, but I do believe that Ginger wanted to eat the birds, and I think if Ginger would have got out, she would have ate the birds. But this is the kind of wordage that he's saying here, that Jesus is saying here. He's saying, look at the birds. If you would just stop worrying for just a second. Just stop. 
Look at the birds. Look at creation. Birds are doing exactly what I created them to do. They're exerting their energy doing what they were created to do. They were created. Just look at them. They're building nests. They're, taking, they're finding food. They're taking it to the little ones. And however, even though they're working, it's because God is providing them. And Jesus is saying, listen up, Christian. If I do that for the birds, don't you think when it comes to my most valuable possession that I can do that too? He's saying that he will provide for us. That doesn't mean that we're lazy. That doesn't mean that we just sit around on the couch all day long just expecting God to pay all of our bills and to take care of us because that's not what God created us to do. He created us to go out and make a living and earn a living and provide for our family. But everything that we do does not come from us. It still comes from God. So if we trust and we just do what God's created us to do, he is going to provide for us. He tells us to stop worrying. It's a worthless exercise. Instead, be hopeful. Next, Jesus says we need to stop worrying because it does nothing for your health. Verse 27 says this. It says, can any one of you, uh, by worrying, add one single hour to your life? My, my guess is the answer is no. But you know what it can do? It can shorten your life. Worrying can shorten your life. There's actually, I read a story this week about a guy that he had several people die in his life with cancer. Several people. His, his parents had passed away when he was a young age and several different people in his family passed away with cancer. And starting as a young teenage boy, he worried about whether he was going to get cancer. And he ended up wasting 30 years of his life worrying about whether he was going to get cancer or not. And he ended up passing away of a heart attack. Guys, we worry about a lot of things that we have no control over. We worry about all that stuff. Guys, listen. The word worry comes from the word that means to choke. It means to choke. It means to strangle. And that's exactly what worry does. Anybody ever feel like when you're, when you're worrying that it's choking and it's strangling the life out of you? You ever feel like that? See, that's what worry does. It chokes and it strangles you. Worry causes you to lose sleep. It, causes, it gives you ulcers. It causes you to have high blood pressure. It causes headaches. It puts people in sour moods. Can I also tell you what worrying does? Worrying will also bring addictions on. You want to know why? Because we use it as an escapement. We use it as an escape from reality. So people that worry a lot, you know what ends, we ends up doing? We can end up uh, trying to escape into overeating. We can get into alcohol. We can get into drugs. We can get into pornography. We can get into all these little things because it's how we try to deal with it. We're worrying about it, so we want our brain to shut off. So we, we, we're tired of this, so we kind of slip off a little bit, and we start putting all these different things. So it can bring addiction problems up. You know what else worry can do? Worry can also damage your relationship with other people and it can also damage your relationship with God if you don't believe me just go in and read the parable of the sower the parable of the sower talks about uh, the, the, the farmer went out and he's sowing the seed and the seed fell on four different soils one fell on the hard path one fell on the rocky path one fell on the thorny path and the other fell on the good soil and then and, and the birds came up on the hard path and they took it away and the, those that fell on the war, uh, the thorny path you know what happens as it's starting to grow up the thorns came up and it started choking it out and it up killing it because it choked it out guys he's illustrating that with us the seed is the gospel do you know how many people have probably accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior decided that I'm tired of my old life and I want to give it to God and I want to come to him and then you know what ends up happening worry gets in there Worry gets in there and it ends up choking the life of the believer. It ends up strangling you out and it ends up pulling you away until finally you fall away. Worrying is dangerous. It's absolutely dangerous and it will destroy your life. There's so many things uh, that, that bad that comes out of there. Listen to this, guys. Worrying won't change your bank account. Worrying won't pay the bills. It won't fix the mess you're in. It won't make the cancer go away. It won't bring your wayward child or your grandchild back. And it won't add one hour to your life. Amen? But we waste a lot of time worrying, don't we? We waste a lot of time worrying. Worry is a worthless exercise. Instead, be hopeful. Next, Jesus assures us that he's going to provide our external, for our external appearance. He says in verses 28 through 30, he says this, And why you do not worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. 
They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you uh, that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes and grass the, uh, of the, the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? The word used here for see is another, ver uh, uh, in some versions say observe the flowers. It's another really strong word here that he's trying to see. And all of these he's trying to see, see, notice, observe, check these things out, pay attention to nature, just look look at how I provide for nature. You know, springtime used to be one of my favorite uh, times to, uh, to go home when we lived out in the country because you could drive down that country road on Z Blacktop and you could look out into the fields, you could look in the ditches and you could see all these wildflowers, you know, growing up and in full bloom and they were just beautiful. And as you looked at them, it made you realize that not a single person planted any of them. You know what? God did. God gets all the glory. He took care of it. And if he can take all this beautiful scenery and he can close the, the fields with the lilies and all these beautiful things and he can uh, he can clothe nature don't you think he can provide for his most valuable possession and that's us I think God's capable of providing for us how many of you like to rock in a rocking chair you like rocking man I like rocking give me a rocking chair up here and I'll just rock while the music's going on but I like rocking it's relaxing I enjoy it however you know what rocking doesn't get you anywhere does it it doesn't get you anywhere, and it's definitely not an exercise that burns calories, right? We'd all be good at uh, doing exercise then. But it's not an exercise that burns cal calories. Can I tell you that worrying is a lot like rocking? Worrying is a lot like rocking. It'll give you something to do, but it'll take you nowhere. And most of us are spending so much time wasting our day worrying. So why shouldn't we worry? Because number one, it's a worthless exercise. And number two, worry is a lack of faith. Worry is a lack of faith. You know, Jesus finishes up in verse 30 by saying, you of little faith. Wouldn't you want Jesus to say those words to you? You of little faith. You know, Jesus finishes up here in verse 30 by saying that. And uh, if you remember... Sermon on the Mount is to show us how we can be disciples looking like him. And he's telling us here that as one of his disciples, that when we worry, when we worry, we are actually operating our lives with an absence of faith. When we worry, we're operating our lives with an absence of faith, meaning that we're no longer trusting God for our needs. Let me ask you a question. Did God provide for you yesterday? Did he? Did God provide for you the day before? Did God provide for you last week? Did God provide for you last month? Did he provide for you last year? Then don't you think he can provide for us today? Don't you think he could provide for us tomorrow? Why do we worry about today? Why do we worry about tomorrow? Listen, guys, the sad truth is, this is sad truth. We have enough faith as Christians to believe that God can get us to heaven right? If you're a Christian, do you believe you're going to heaven? We have enough faith that we believe that God can get us to heaven, but the unfortunate thing is we don't have enough faith to believe that God can get us through the next 24 hours. Isn't that crazy? To think that we can believe enough faith that God will take us to heaven someday, but we don't have enough faith to believe that God can get us over the next 24 hours. We have an absolute confidence in the sweet by and by, but we're terrified of the nasty here and now. And it scares us. We need to exercise our faith. Jesus says it's a lack of faith. He says worry is a lack of faith. Instead, be hopeful. So Jesus brings all this to conclusion here, and he drives it home one more time. In verse 31 and 32, he says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows what you need. Listen, guys, the grammar here uh, is uh, the grammar here that's used in this do not worry is actually different from the grammar that was used in verse 25. In verse 25, he was saying stop worrying. In this, the actual original wording is he's saying do not even begin worrying. Uh, wor worrying. So in other words, Jesus is saying this. He's saying don't just stop. Don't even begin it. Don't even begin worrying. Don't worry about all that for a couple of reasons. The first reason he tells us is when we worry, we're no different than the pagans. 
We're no different than the pagans. That's a.k.a. unbelievers. He's saying that we're no different than the unbelievers. Uh, because, see, the unbelievers in this day, you know, they would pursue after food and drink and clothing in a very unhealthy way. And they were tormented by worry and anxiety because they didn't have God as a loving father. They didn't trust that anyone was going to provide for them. So they would have all this anxiety and all this stress. And they had an absence of peace in their life because they lacked the faith in God. And Jesus is saying, look, you're acting no different than an unbeliever. How are you ever going to win? them over guys the same truth goes for us today when we have high levels of worry and anxiety we're no different than someone that has no hope in their lives our lives should be a witness to an unbelieving world and we should do that because we're resting in the fact that God's got this no matter what Guys, when our world's crumbling and falling apart, when we can walk through it in victory, when we can walk through it in peace, then you know what it tells an unbelieving world? It tells an unbelieving world, I want your God in my life. How in the world can you go through what you're going through with your head held high and your eyes fixed on something that I don't get it, I don't understand. I'm a non-believer, but I know I want the peace that you have. And you can say, because I know my God's going to provide. I walk with him, I know him, I talk with him, and he will provide. And Jesus says, when we don't operate in this fashion, we're no different. We're no different than somebody that doesn't believe, guys. In a shaky world, falling apart all the way around us, we need to be people that point people to how they can walk on solid ground. And secondly, secondly, there's no reason to start worrying because verse 32 says, God knows we need them. God knows we need them. So we can have faith that God's going to provide. Let me ask you a question. If you have kids, if you have kids, have you ever had your kids? Uh, what, what do you think if your kids would come up every day and say, hey, Dad, are you going to pay the mortgage payment today? Hey, Dad, are you going to provide shelter for me today? Hey, Dad, are you going to put food on the table today? Hey, Dad, are you going to provide clothing? I'm afraid you're not going to give me clothing. Hey, Dad, are you going to do this? Hey, Dad, are you going to do that? I think eventually I would say, would you stop it? Good grief, you're wearing me out. I love you. Look, I love you. And I'm going to provide shelter for you. I'm going to provide uh, food for you. I'm going to provide clothing for you. Do you understand when you keep asking me and you keep bugging me and you keep worrying about it and worrying about it, it just absolutely makes me feel like you do not trust me. It makes me feel like that you do not have faith that I can take care of things. How much more do you think God feels when we worry about everything? He's saying, stop it. I love you. Of course I'm going to take care of you. I know what you need. Of course you're going to make it through the day. Of course I'm going to provide for you. He's saying, stop worrying. Stop worrying. So you know what? Jesus tells us the answer here, how we can overcome the destructive problem of worrying. He tells us the answer can be found in Matthew 6, This was one of the first scriptures that I memorized when I got saved 15 years ago. And it's, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Jesus says we are to seek God first. Seek God first, above everything else. And in, in, in the word each here that Jesus uses, when he goes from observe, he goes to see, he goes to this, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger as he goes along. And this very word seek here comes from the Greek word zetio, which is Z-E-T-E-O, and is what this is. It describes an active bird hunter. It describes somebody that's going out and he's hunting birds. And he's not just doing it for the sport, he's doing it because he hunts for food. And so he's got his eye on that bird. He sees the bird from the distance and he's watching watching the bird all the way in. He doesn't take his eyes off the bird. He watches it all the way in and he knows he's got a very brief time to take advantage of what it does and he never takes his eye off the bird. That bird becomes the center of his focus. It becomes the center of his attention, the center of everything he looks at. That's the word picture here that Jesus is saying here. He's saying we need to seek God at the center of our attention at absolutely everything that we do. Just like that hunter would not keep his eyes off that, we need to seek God. We need to seek his righteousness. We need to seek his kingdom. We need to have our eyes centered on God. You see, guys, most of us right now, we understand the power of seek. We understand the power that he's talking about in this word. We understand it and we get it. However, you know what we do? We demonstrate it in a very unhealthy way. We demonstrate this word in a very unhealthy way. We know what we do. We seek, we zoom in on our problems, don't we? 
All of a sudden, something happens, and man, the whole world, we just forget about it, and we zoom in on that problem, and we just think about that problem nonstop, and we end up overanalyzing that problem, and we end up worrying about the worst-case scenario when it comes to that problem, and we worry, we worry, we worry, we think about it, we think about it, we think about it, we seek it, we zoom in, and that's all we do, that's all we do. We understand the power of seek, but we use it in a negative way. You know what Jesus says? He's saying, seek God out like that. Seek God out with the same passion, the same intensity that you do your problems. Seek him out the same way like that. Zoom in on God. Think about God. Focus on God. Dwell on God's goodness. Meditate on God's truth. Rest in God's promises. Trust in God's provision. And when you do this, worry and will no longer consume your life. He says to seek me first. Seek me first in his righteousness. Jesus says there's a better way to live. I'm going to ask the praise band to come on up. Let me ask you a question. Do you have your eyes on Jesus? Are you seeking Jesus first in absolutely everything you do? Has his kingdom become the top priority of your life? Or is God's kingdom somewhere down the line and you've come accustomed to just being a worry wart and saying that that's just the way it is? Guys, I'm telling you, when we seek God first in every area of our life, when we do that, we can rest in the truth that he will take care of all of our needs. Jesus says that worry is worthless and it demonstrates a lack of faith that clouds our vision. Have you ever drove through fog before? It's hard to see, isn't it? when you drive through fog? Well, you know, several years ago, the Bureau of Standards in Washington, several years ago, they published a study on fog. You know, fog as we know it, it's just really a low cloud and it's a collection of extremely uh, fine water droplets. Well, the Bureau of Standards, they looked into the question of how much water is in a typical fog bank. How much water is in a typical fog bank? So they did research and fog that will reach seven city blocks up to a hundred foot deep, seven blocks, hundred foot deep. They took that and they figured out how much, how many water droplets goes into making a fog blanket that thick. You know what they found out? They found out that it takes 60 billion water droplets, 60 billion water droplets. Okay, very tiny water droplets. Seems like a lot, doesn't it? You know how much 60 billion water droplets is? No more than an average glass of water. Pretty crazy, isn't it? See, that's what worry is. It gives us this gigantic fog in our life. It just clouds our vision. It keeps our eyes off of God. It focuses our attention on the problem instead of Him. Jesus closes with this scripture in verse 34 with two final thoughts. He says, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I'm going to give you a real deep thought right here. Are you ready for a deep thought? Today is the yesterday you were worried about tomorrow. Pretty deep, isn't it? I'll repeat it again. Today is the yesterday you were worried about tomorrow. You know, Mark Twain... Mark Twain said, I'm an old man, and I've known great many troubles, but most of them never happened. Most of the things that we worry about never happen. We've wasted our time worrying about something that's useless. Abraham Lincoln said this. He said, the best thing about the future is it only comes one day at a time. Do you think you can trust God for today? Get up tomorrow and trust Him for tomorrow. Don't worry about the next day. Don't worry about the next guy. Guys, if we are going to overcome the problem with worry, you have to recognize it's sin. You have to recognize it's sin. Give it to God. Seek His kingdom first. And decide that we're tired of playing games like this. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you something that you can do that's going to help you with this worry. If, you have, if you're somebody that worries and you constantly worry nonstop, then I'm going to ask you this week to put together a worry box. Okay? And this is how the worry box is going to work. You're going to get a shoe box. And every time you have a concern that you want to pray about, I want you to write it down on a piece of paper. And I want you to put it in that box. And I want you to put it up on the shelf. And I want you to say, God, I give you my concern. It's not going to turn into worry. It's not going to consume me. It's not going to take over me. And I'm going to give it to you because I believe in you. I believe I trust in you. I believe that you're going to get me through it. I believe that you're going to help me through it. And I'm going to give it to you. And then the next time the devil wants to tempt you to worry about it, you know what you're going to say? You're going to say, uh-uh. Not in my house. 
I'm not going to worry about that because I've already given it to God. I've already put it up there and I've already worried about it. But you know what? If you keep tempting with it and you keep thinking that, yeah, I do want to worry about it, I'm going to go ahead and worry about it, then this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to your closet. I want you to get that box out. I want you to open it up. I want you to find your worry, your concern, and I want you to grab it and I want you to tell God, you know what? I want this back because I don't believe you can provide for me. I don't believe you're big enough. I don't have enough faith for this. So I want my worry about uh, back and I'm just going to take it. I'm telling you what, guys, it'll change your focus. See, that's what we do when we keep worrying about it. Let's give our problems. Let's give our things to God. Let's have a concern for things. Let's do what we can do about it and trust God for the results. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand at your feet. and I want you to bow your heads for just a moment. Guys, you cannot overcome worry until you first know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So I want everybody to bow their head and close their eyes for just a second. And I want to ask you the question, do you know that you know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Have you trusted him with your life? And if you have not, then I want you to slip up your hands right now and say, Pastor, that's me. I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to have that faith. I want to know my Heavenly Father. I want to know that God loves me and provide for me like you're talking about. Would you raise up your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. Would you do that? I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want us to say this prayer together. Say, Dear God, I believe in you. I believe in your son, Jesus. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I ask you to forgive me. Come into my life and save me. God, help me to be a person that completely trusts in you. I give you all my concerns and all my worries and I want to operate in faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.